Good morning. Good morning, Journey Church. How y'all doing? Amen. Amen. So look, we are excited. That's the skit guys right there, and they're going to be coming uh, closer to the end of the month. We want you to be a part of uh, the blessing that they're going to bring to Journey Church, so be sure and get your ticket soon because seating is limited to this building, so y'all be sure and get on that quick. Uh, I'm going to jump into it here in a moment, but I just got to give God praise for a few things, man. How y'all like this new carpet up in here? Like, I, you, you may have not even noticed, and we could worship God all the same with the other purple carpet, but this looks so much better, and God has blessed us to be able to do that, blessed us with this, uh, this trampoline park. You helped give to that and uh, made that a possibility. Somebody said, why would y'all do a trampoline park? Does it take all that? No, but kids sure love jumping on it, and they will come to jump, and whenever they do, they're going to get Jesus and the gospel, and that's going to change their eternity, so I think that's worth it. And uh, also just being able to do the, uh, the pack the bus, uh, stuff the bus uh, project that we did. Just so many things. Uh, people are being saved and baptized. God is blessing Journey Church. His favor is upon us. So y'all give him praise one more time for everything that he's doing and we get to be a part of. So my name is uh, Richie. I'm the student pastor here at Journey. And uh, I'm so blessed and excited to be able to bring the word to you this morning. I uh, just want to give Pastor James and Miss Debbie a huge shout out. We love y'all. Thank you so much for all you do. Yeah, y'all give them some love this morning. And so y'all get rested and relaxed and uh, come back ready to run. Thankful for my wife for putting up with me. And uh, she's my biggest uh, help and support. And thank you for allowing me to do what I do. And uh, my small group, I don't just encourage you to get into a small group. I'm in a small group because I lean on those people too. And, and I can't do life alone either. So I love y'all. And I'm so thankful for y'all and my family. So, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about a story probably seven or eight years ago now is, uh, is when it happened. I was youth pastor at a church. And uh, in Ruston, Louisiana. And I'm youth pastor in there and things are, are going well. And then the church that I was at took on uh, another campus. It was going to be a satellite campus. And so the, my leadership at the time, they began uh, putting feelers out and discussing who's going to be the campus pastor. And, and so a couple weeks went by and like to my surprise, I wasn't really thinking about this, but my name ends up in the hat to go and be this campus pastor in Spring Hill. And so we go through these interview processes and we talk to, you know, all these people. And long story short, they're like, you got it. You're going to be this campus pastor in Spring Hill, Louisiana. My wife and I were newlyweds. We've been married for like six months. And so we pack everything up and we move an hour and a half away to Spring Hill, Louisiana. It's about three seconds from the Arkansas line. You throw a rock and you're in Arkansas. And so we move up there, and uh, it's our first, first official Sunday there. And I'll, I'll never forget, I'm standing close to the front. You know, it would be the equivalent of about this chair right here. And uh, I'm worshiping. And all of a sudden, I feel God impress in my spirit. Maybe he's done this before where it's like, this voice comes to me, and it, he, he just he speaks these words. He says, Richie, this is going to be a house of plenty. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I say, praise God, what a good word. I said, man, I lo love getting words like that. And, uh, and so keep praising, worshiping. The preaching comes, and, you know, it's a great service. So then the, uh, the service is over, and Joy and I, we hook up with the with the the former pastor, and he's still showing us the ropes as he's on his way out. So he walks us to the back, and uh, the way that they did things is they did the, the money, the tithes and offerings, and paid the bills right there on Sunday morning after it was received. And so we walk back there, he shows us the rope, we pay the bills, and then when everything is paid, I see we've got $40 left in the church's general fund. He said, oh, by the way, I haven't been able to take a salary in two weeks. Y'all have fun. I said, good one, God. Now I understand why you told me this is going to be a house of plenty 
and you own the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all clear to me now because he knew that I was going to need that promise once I saw things as they truly were. And so it wasn't long after that, Joy and I, we go home. And naturally, the question comes, Richie, what are we going to do? I don't know. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, though. And, and so, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what we're going to do. I said, Joy, you and I, we, we labored over this. We prayed over this. We, we believe God moved us here. We don't, we, we don't believe we moved on our own accord. We believe God called us to this place. And I said, look, if God called us to it, he's got to see us through it. I said, this thing is either going to go up and we're going to be fine or it's going to go down. And, and it didn't have much further to go down, I promise you. But, but can I tell you something? We were, we were faithful to what God called us to do. I said, Joy, I, I just, I'll work at Walmart if I have to work at Walmart, but I'm going to provide for this family. But it didn't even take all that because God was faithful. That church doubled, tripled in size. People were being saved and baptized. People that were not tithing began tithing. Uh, we were actually putting money in the bank, and it had not been doing that. What did God, God said, see, I told you this was going to be a house of plenty. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. That church never went without and joy and I never went without. Why? Because that's the faithfulness of the God that we serve. And so I, I say that to kind of prop up the message today, so to speak. Maybe, maybe you're here today, and uh, maybe, maybe there's a dream in your heart. Maybe there's a vision. Maybe there's an idea that God has placed in your heart, and you feel it. There's a passion in your soul. You say, I know God has called me to do something for his kingdom. But the issue is you, you look at the natural. Maybe you look at your bank account. Maybe, maybe you look at your resources. Maybe you look at your time. You're looking at everything in the natural, and you're saying, I just don't see how this can happen. You just, I, I don't see how it can happen. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I don't know how this is going to happen. Can I remind you this morning, we serve the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And one pastor said it this way, he owns the potatoes under it too. And so I want to tell you, if God calls you to it, he can and will see you through it and provide for you. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. And so the title of this message today is Multiply for Ministry. Multiply for Ministry. See, I believe that God wants to bless you. I believe that God wants to multiply what you have, not just so that you can be in good shape. He wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. I want to look at some principles from the Word of God this morning that I believe help bring us into alignment to receive the things that God has stored up for us. They are prepared. Do you believe that? Yeah. They're prepared. They're waiting for us. I believe it's on us to come into alignment so that we can receive what God has so that we can be a blessing to others. I'm reminded of the story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Matthew 14, 13 through 21, we'll start reading. It says, when Jesus heard what happened, in other words, he heard that John the Baptist had just been killed and beheaded, what did he do? He withdrew by, bro by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing this, the crowds, they followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, listen to this, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Somebody say compassion. The first thing that I want you to see this morning is that Jesus cares for the multitudes. Jesus cared and he still does for the multitudes. Mark 6, 34, this is giving the, the same, this is a different account of the same story. It said, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. This is so important for us to grasp this morning because it shows us that everything that Jesus did, 
He fed the 5,000, the miracles that he performed, the, the reason that he taught. It was all rooted and based and grounded in his compassion for the people. If we miss this point right here, I think we miss all of it. He, had, he was driven and compelled by the compassion that he had for the people and also his obedience to God. If you and I are going to do something great for God's kingdom, I believe we must allow God to impress deep into our spirit and in our soul the compassion that he has for the multitudes. You see, sometimes it's hard to love people, right? I'm hard to love. <laughs> like, I, I just, I, people are hard to love. Some pastors joke around, but I'll share it with you. They're like, how's it going? Ministry's great. You know what? Man, I love pastoring if it weren't for the people. And that's a little, that's, <laughs> that's a little joke, but the reality is, is that people are hard to love sometimes. And guess what? If we're ever going to do anything for the kingdom and do it long term, we've got to have a supernatural impression of God's compassion for the people because we can't do it on our own. He wants to put his compassion down in us. I'm looking for my words, how I want to do this, because I made some arrows on my page, which meant switch it around, and now I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I was trying to say this. Is... You've got a dream and a vision, right? You, you've got a passion. You've got an idea. You, you want to do something. Let me ask you this. If, if God gave you that thing, if he gave you what you really wanted, what you really desired, what would you do with it? What would you really do with it? Would you use it to advance his kingdom? Would you glorify and honor God with it? Would you use it and out of compassion begin to serve the people around you and, and serve the multitudes? How would you use it if you got it? James 4, 2, and 3 says, You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. That's pretty extreme. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight amongst one another. Can I tell you how many times I've seen people, somebody will pass away in their family and they have an inheritance, and the family, instead of grieving the lost loved one, they're fighting about who gets this and who gets that, and was I in the will, and this and that, it, rooted and grounded in covetousness and selfishness. It says, you do not have because you do not ask. Then, when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. I believe this. Some blessings are withheld simply because we do not ask. Boy, when, I, when we get this principle, I think we'll start asking God more. You have not because you ask not. Let me ask you this morning. Have you verbalized your desires and prayers to the Lord? Have you asked him for it? Some of your blessings are a breath and a prayer away. God's saying, I'm ready to give it to you. Will you ask me? Poof, here it is. But then the writer brings a little bit of clarification. He says, but some of you ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. You ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. In other words, God sees the true motives of our heart. You know that, right? I mean, we can talk a good game. We can say, oh, God, I'll use this for your glory if you bless me. This is... Let me ask you something. Are you using what you have right now to glorify God? Are you using your resources right now to bring him honor and glory and reach the people? If you're not using what you have right now and you get this blessing, you're not going to use it then either. Can I preach this morning? You see, God sees... The motives. He, he really knows. I believe God withholds some things because he knows if I answer this and give you what you're asking, you can't handle it. It will destroy you. I, I think God will never know until the other side that it was truly a blessing that we didn't get what we want because God knew that we couldn't handle it. 
So let me ask you this. Can you handle what you ask for? Can you truly handle what you desire? Can God trust you with it? You see, it's not so much what God can get to you. It's about what he can get through you. If God gives you something, are you going to use it properly? I've heard it said like this. God cannot give to a clenched hand. He gives to an open hand. But guess what? That open hand may mean, hey, you're just a conduit. It's going to come to you and go through you. I remember when God gave Joy and I a, a little bit of money, and it was not a lot of money, I promise you. But it was a lot for us at the time. <laughs> and I felt like God put on my heart who to give that to. And for a specific purpose, I said, I ain't doing that. I'm keeping this. And then I felt like God convicted me and said, okay, Richie, I know your cap now, and that's what I can trust you with. I said, God, I, I want to be trusted with more. I don't want this to be my cap. It's okay. Hey, God's got a second, and third, fourth, fifth chances. Guess what? I got that same amount of money again. God said, what are you going to do with it? God, I'm giving it away because I don't want this to be my cap. I'm not saying give away everything you got, but what I am saying is be obedient to what he calls you to do. Can he get it through you? Be willing to serve others with what you had. Jesus cared for the multitudes, and so should we, and we should be willing to serve them. And so Matthew 14, 15, and 16, as the evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. This is a desolate place, a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And so to me, it sounds like these disciples, they cared for the people. They had compassion upon them. Jesus, it's getting late. These people are tired. Send them away to the villages so that they can get some grub. Don't, these people are about to faint and fall over. And you know what they're really thinking is, Jesus, we hungry too. Let us go. But Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. He says, you give them something to eat. No, we're not sending them away. I have care and compassion. You have care and compassion. Don't send them away. You give them something to eat. And that's the second point is Jesus calls us to minister. Jesus cares for the multitudes and so should we. But number two, Jesus calls us to minister. You see, it's not simply enough to care or have compassion. Jesus calls to activate our care and compassion for the people. It's one thing to have an idea, but it's a totally different thing to begin to act on that idea. The Bible says that faith without works is dead. Is God putting a dream, a vision, a passion in your heart? Are you just sitting on it? Are you beginning to put feet to that faith and do something about it? You know, I love when people say, they, they come and they say, man, I've got such a great idea. I just, ooh, God dropped us in my heart. God, I, ooh, you know what we need to do, Pastor Richie? Y'all need to start a X, Y, Z, whatever it is. I said, I love that idea. You should really do that. <laughs> oh, well, I, oh, no, no. I, I'm not saying me. I'm saying y'all should. Uh, you know, hey, It's one thing to have an idea, but it's another thing to do something with that idea. Are you putting feet to your faith? Or are you just sitting on it? The disciples tried to send them away. They need to go get something to eat. Jesus said, no, they ain't going nowhere. You're going to feed them. What's the point? Jesus calls us to minister. See, it's one thing to see the problem and to point out the problem, but we don't want to just see problems. We want to be part of the solution, amen? We want to be part of meeting the need to do what it takes and put feet to our faith and say, you know what? I may not have all the answers, but I'm going to use what I do have. That's basically what happened in the story. Disciples, they care for the multitudes. They have this sense of compassion. They see a problem. They see the people are hungry. Lord, let them go get some to eat. Jesus basically says, that's a great idea, but you're going to feed them. Matthew 9, 35 through 38, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers or laborers into the harvest field. Can I tell you something? Jesus is not looking for a bunch of talkers. And Jesus is not looking for only thinkers. Let me bring some clarification. He doesn't want us to be brainless, so don't twist what I said. Jesus wants us to think we need to have strategy. We need to have good ideas. We need to be intentional about our plan and what we're doing. But guess what? A field does not get harvested by sitting around talking and thinking about it all day. Guess what? It gets harvested when people put their boots on and begin to labor and put their hand to do something. And can I tell you something? Alexandria and Pineville and Grant Parish and Rapids and out there, Oakdale and all of North Central. Louisiana, the harvest is plentiful and it's ready. But Jesus is looking at Journey Church and saying, I need some laborers. And I just wonder if we're ready to answer the call. And I believe we are. I believe we're doing it. But God's saying, I've got so much more in store, but I need the laborers to rise up and say, put me to work, Lord. I'm ready to do whatever it takes. There's someone in your workplace. There's someone in your family. There's someone at your school. The harvest is ripe and ready for the picking, but what are we doing? What are we doing with it? God's looking for some laborers. Jesus, he calls us to minister. Will you answer that call and say, I'm, I'm going to be part of the solution. I don't want to just point out problems. The disciples, they say, Lord, it's getting late. The people, they're tired and they're hungry. Send them away so that they can get something to eat. Jesus says, no, you're going to feed them. Matthew 14, 17 through 21. I love this part. So they have compassion. They care for the people. They see a need. They want to be a part of meeting the need. But here's the problem. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Jesus said, bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Some scholars say that there could have been fifteen to 20,000 people in that crowd that got fed. Maybe you're here today and you say, I have, I have compassion, Pastor Richie. I hear you loud and clear. And, and I want to be part of the solution. I don't want to just point out the problems. I know the harvest is ready. Put me to work. But the problem is all I have is these two fish and five loaves. All I have is this little job title. All I have is this little social security check. All I have is this little group of people that I work with. All I have is this little talent. All I have is my good, all I have is this produce stand. You know that there are people here at this church, they have chickens and part of their ministry is they bring fresh eggs to people. What are they doing? They're using what God has given them. Let me ask you something. What is your all I have? What, what, what does that mean for you, God? I know you've called me to this, but all I have is fill in the blank. God can do more than you think with all you have. Uh, I wanted to say this. I thought it was good. I don't care. You know, I I thought it was good. (laughs) The mountain isn't moved by the size of your resource. The mountain is moved by the size of your faith. Some of us are looking at our resource 
saying, there's no way I could do anything with this. You're putting your faith in the wrong thing. You're putting yourself in what you have versus the God that we serve. Let me ask you something this morning. Since when was God dependent on us? And since when was God confined and restricted by our resource when he tells us, I'm El Shaddai, the more than enough God, the all-sufficient one, the one who meets all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You need to stop looking looking at your lack because it's getting you off track and look at the source, the one who will give you everything you need. It's not the size of your resource, it's the size of your faith and with faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain and it will jump into the sea. Quit looking at your lack and look at your God. Lord, all we have are these five loaves and these two fish. Jesus says, come here, bring them to me. Jesus is asking the same of us today. I see what you've got. He says, bring it to me. Bring me what you do have. Bring it to me and entrust it to me. Lay it at my feet. Let my blessing be upon it and watch what I can do because little is much with God and God will use ordinary things to do the extraordinary things. And what you see in the natural, when you submit it to him, he'll put a super on it and do something supernatural. I believe this. God doesn't only want to. I I love this woman right here. Isn't this for you, huh? I'm I'm looking at you. I'm so excited, uh, Miss Cindy, because this woman is a perfect example. She, she shared this. <laughs> it's been in her, her heart and it's been her dream to open up her bakery since she was a little girl. Baking with your grandmother, is that right? This woman has been baking out of her kitchen, selling cakes for how many years? For six years. Her house has been her office and, and, and her kitchen, baking out of her house, selling to people. Can I tell you something? She just broke ground right up the road and is going to be building. <laughs> it's so awesome. If you don't see that in action, what did she do? God, I've got a vision. God, I've got a dream. I submit it to you. I don't have this place yet, but guess what? I will one day, and I'm going to do and use what I, I'm going to do what I can with what I've got, and I'm going to bake out of my kitchen. Don't you tell me he can't do it. (laughs) Little is much when God is in it. Quit disqualifying yourself because you don't think you have enough resources. Use what you've been given. Disciples, they bring the lunch to Jesus, and Jesus told the disciples, sit down on the grass. I've got to hurry. Four minutes. They sit down on the grass, and Mark and Luke, they record that people sat down in groups of 50s and 100s. I don't think this is here by accident. They're getting ready to minister to 20,000 people. How many of you know that God is a God of order, not disorder? It's going to take order to minister to all these people. Have them sit down in groups on the grass. They sit down in groups of 50s and 100. I also think it's significant because it's in those groups they were doing life together and fellowshipping with one another. And as they're doing life together, they're getting ready to witness the miracle. Their needs are getting ready to be met physically and spiritually. Can I tell you something? There is significance to doing life with one another. Pastor James' heart burns for us to do life together. That is what Journey on the Go is about. That's why we're doing it, because you were not created to do life in isolation because it leads to desolation, but to do life in the context of community and relationship. If God hasn't spoke to you yet, get involved in this Journey on the Go. Do life with someone. The people, they sit down. Jesus takes this little lunch. He looks up to heaven and he breaks it. He gives it to the disciples and they distribute it to the people. Verse 20, they all ate and they were satisfied. Disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces left over. Left over. This is so significant because 12 in the Bible 
represents perfection. It's a perfect number. It symbolizes God's power and authority. What Jesus was demonstrating is I've got authority over your resources. I am the more than enough God, El Shaddai, and he will bless anything that you submit to him and place at his feet. Not only will he multiply the resource, but he will multiply the effectiveness and do far more than you ever had dreamed or imagined he could do with it. Let me say this. I know i got to close. I often wonder, it's easy for us to read this story and think that Jesus just took this little lunch and he broke it and, and prayed a blessing over it and then there was just a, a, a big buffet table of all this food that wasn't there before. It, it's easy to read it like it was just instantaneous. Can I tell you something? That is not the way the miracle happened. In Luke chapter 9, 16, New American Standard, he took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and gave them to the disciples again and again to serve the crowd. He didn't just, in other words, this wasn't an instant miracle. It was a progressive miracle where the disciples had to come to him, trusting him as the source time and time again. Jesus, I'm out of bread. Come to him and get it and go minister. Jesus, I'm out of fish and bread. Come to him and go and minister. Many of us, we miss our miracle because we're looking for an instant blessing. When God says, I want to bless you progressively, don't give up on the process. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Keep doing what is right for in proper season. You will reap a harvest of blessing if you do not give up. Keep coming to him as your source and do what you know he's called you to do. We have to stop saying, God, when I get more money, I'll, no, use what he's given you now. God, when I have more time, I'll serve. No, you won't serve right now. God, when you give me more influence, I'll, I, I'll use it. Use what you've got now. He who is faithful with little will be faithful also with much. How are you using what he's given you right now? See, Jesus cares for the multitudes, and so should we. Jesus calls us to serve, and Jesus is the more than enough God. God has all these things. I believe he wants to get it to us so that we can bless the people around us. Let me say this. Jesus calls us to care, but he cares for you. He cares for you right where you're at. He knows what you're going through. He says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. Have you come into this place burdened and weighed down this morning? I, I want to challenge you today. Don't carry it any longer. Don't come in and hear a message like this and walk right out with it. He cares for you. Cast that care upon him and feel the peace. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Do you, know, do you know Jesus as Lord? Is he your savior? Is he your best friend? Ask him for forgiveness and he'll make you brand new. Maybe you've come in and you've been really bad about pointing out the problems or you see the problems, but today you want to make a decision to be part of the solution. Hey, maybe that means serving here at Journey. Maybe that means getting involved in Journey on the go. Maybe, maybe he's calling you to do something at work, but decide today. I'm going to be part of the solution. And finally, maybe you know Jesus has called you something, but you're looking at what you have in the natural and you don't see how it could happen. You want God's supernatural blessing on that resource. Let's go after it today. Y'all do me a favor and stand this morning as we get ready to close. Maybe you want to follow through in biblical public baptism, join the church. Maybe you need resources on something, a small group, a serve team, whatever it is. Allow God to have his will and his way and move in your life today. Lord, I thank you for your blessing. Lord, give us grace. Lord, help us to do what you've called us to do. I think the harvest is ripe. Send out laborers, Lord, to do what you've called us to do. Multiply us for ministry. Have your will, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.